All right, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for coming. Let's all uh, stand. And um, let, let's open in prayer. Father, thank you again for another opportunity tonight to, to glorify you. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for the privilege of allowing mere mortals to worship the living God and that you would accept worship at our hands, uh, which, Father, we know that it has nothing to do with us. We are, we are imperfect. We are sinners. Uh, because of what Jesus Christ has done on Calvary, Father, you accept our worship and, and even use it, not just for your glory, but you use it to edify the church. And we pray that would take place tonight in every aspect of what goes on here. Uh, the fellowship, we pray we'd be a blessing to one another, that we would exhort and lift up one another, encourage one another. Thank you for this morning and the many folks that attended, the visitors. We thank you for what you did. And now we just ask your blessing tonight as you continue uh, blessing us and glorifying your name. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Please remain standing. All right, let's turn to hymn 253. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, hymn 253. Oh, so are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's a light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Through death into life everlasting he passed and we follow him there for us sin no more hath dominion for more than conquerors we are turn your eyes upon Jesus Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Amen. All right, uh, just a couple of announcements. Uh, our next quarterly business meeting will be on July 19th at 7 p.m., uh, our next uh, soup and chili finger food uh, fill in the blank fellowship, uh, uh, followed by a panel discussion, will be on Sunday, July 30th. Please submit discussion topics to any of our leaders. Uh, Craig Hartman, uh, Craig Hartman, will be with us on Sunday morning, July 23rd. Uh, be try and be there for that. As he's always a blessing to hear, uh, Brother Hartman. And uh, the next PARBC conference will be at Marsh Creek Fellowship Baptist Church 
in Wellsboro, Pennsylvania on September 11th through the 13th. This time I'll have the ushers come forward as you take our general offering. <coughs> Uh, James, could I have you say for a moment, please? Well, Spirit, Lord, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for your blessing, Lord. Thank you for your peace and mercy, Lord. We thank you for the blessing that we learned in this morning, in school, in summer, Lord. It was a blessing. We pray for the office, Lord, and the good blessing, Lord, for your glory. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, Tella Allah. Appreciate that. God bless Tella Allah. Man, I'm wearing many hats in this church. We appreciate him jumping in there, playing piano. What a blessing. In Shady Green Pastures. I forget the name of that song. God Leads Us Along. God Leads Us Along. Some Through the Water, Some Through the Flood. Yeah. yeah. All Through the Blood. Amen. All right, let's open our Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 3. Uh, we are preaching through Jeremiah. Tonight is message number 25. And we are only in chapter 3, so we got a long way to go. We may be, I may be preaching this till the Lord returns. I'm okay with that. Of course, if he returns tonight, then I will have preached through it till the Lord returns. Jeremiah chapter 3, let's all stand for the reading of God's Word. Tonight's text is verses 16 through 18. Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. After I read it, please bow with me in prayer. Jeremiah chapter 3, beginning of verse 16. And it shall come to pass, when you be multiplied and increased in the land, in those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more, the ark of the covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mind, Neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done any more. At that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. 
In those days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel, and they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given for an inheritance unto your fathers. May God bless his word. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, thank you for your your word. And we thank you, Lord, that when you are dealing with us as with children and as you dealt with Judah and Israel, your people, uh, that you gave them opportunity to repent before you would punish them and send chastisement always for their good. And Father, even when even when you were in the middle of judging them or when you are judging us or, or chastening us, uh, you still offer that promise of hope. And Father, we rejoice that no matter, no matter what turmoils and troubles we go through on this side of glory, that we will be with you in heaven forever. We will be rejoicing. We, there will be no more sin, no more sadness, no more tears. And uh, Lord, we look forward to that. We thank you uh, that you are a God of hope. And I pray today that you would help us once again to put things in perspective so that when we tend to magnify this life, this earth, when we tend to think that this is all we have, or perhaps when we get our roots dug too deeply into this life, remind us, Father, of what's truly important and help us to learn the lessons of tonight for your glory. And we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. All right, let's take our hymnals. We'll open up to hymn 149, He Leadeth Me, hymn 149.
Good evening. Thank you for coming tonight. It is a blessing to have you here. Thank you for those of you that are joining us online. I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn to Jeremiah chapter 3. Jeremiah chapter 3. We are uh, learning what God's message is to the, uh, the nation of Judah, uh, which was the, the, uh, of the, the divided kingdom. Israel had already been judged. The northern tribes, now Judah's being uh, warned that what happened to Israel is going to happen to them, and of course it would, but Jeremiah is, the, um, is, is God's last ditch effort to say, uh, to challenge Judah to repent. Jeremiah represents God's love, represents God's mercy, because during his long, quite long ministry, he was calling the Jews to repentance and to get right with God, and even told them what was ahead. And as his message develops, uh, and by the way, please understand, I don't think I've said this yet, the book of Jeremiah is not necessarily laid out chronologically. Uh, some, it, 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 Jeremiah is interesting because there's a poem, there's poetic portions, and there's also just prose or writings. And uh, depending on what it is, sometimes commentators, theologians believe that certain sections may be from when he was preaching during this king. Other sections are from this king, so it's not necessarily laid out chronologically. Uh, but during Jeremiah's lengthy ministry towards the end, it became very evident to him uh, that the people of Judah were not listening to his message. And so that's when he started to really get specific that God already has it lined up. Who the king is that's going to come and judge you. Call, he calls him his God's servant. And it was not a, a God worshiping, a, a Yahweh worshiping God, uh, a king. It was a pagan king, but he was going to be God's servant in the same way that Joe Biden is God's servant and every leader is God's servant. God holds their hand in his heart. And they may, they may not give God the time of day. They may show no, show no respect for God. God's still in charge. And again, sometimes he gives a country... Not the, nation, the, the leaders they need, but the, the, the leaders that they deserve. So now, God is um, challenging the people of Israel. And we come to an interesting section in verses 16 through 18, where a particular item is brought up by Jeremiah. Uh, this item is also referenced because commentators aren't exactly sure uh, whether this was, this very, very, very well may have been um, during Josiah's, when Josiah was the king, that Jeremiah was meet, ministering and preaching uh, this particular message where he refers to the Ark of the Covenant. So uh, whatever the case is, this reference, and then in Second Chronicles, uh, the other place that is men mentions the Ark of the Covenant, those would be the last time that the Ark of the Covenant is mentioned. And um, so we're going to talk about what, what is the Ark of the Covenant? Why did it play into Jeremiah's message, challenge, oracle uh, to the people of Judah? Uh, and what do we have to learn from that? So let's look again at Jeremiah chapter 3. We're going to break down each, each verse is going to be a point. Uh, verse 16 is uh, what I call out with the old. Verse 17 is in with the new, and then verse 18 is the transformation that takes place. And what was happening to Israel or Judah specifically uh, really could pattern our lives uh, when we think about the day that we came to know Christ as our Savior. So look at verse 16. And it shall come to pass, when ye be multiplied and increased in the land. Now understand... That uh, the northern tribes, again, Israel, were not in the land. Most of them were not in the land. They had already been brought into a, a captivity in Assyria. Then Babylon would conquer them and bring them, and then God would also conquer Judah and bring them into captivity. And so during the, the years of captivity, the Jews always longed to go back home. And so this is definitely Jeremiah is looking to a future time. Eventually, he's going to ultimately culminate his message in talks of the new covenant, which is still future, which God 
promises to his people. Uh, but here, he's, he's making reference to, and he's really implying that there's going to be a time when you're going to be gone. Judah, you're not going to be here anymore. You're going to be carried captivity in, in Babylon. But there is going to come a time when you are multiplied and increased in the land in those days, saith the Lord. They shall say no more. So this is painting a picture for Israel, the people of Judah, and saying there's going to be a time when you are not going to say any more the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Neither shall it come to mind. Neither shall they remember it. Neither shall they visit it. Neither shall that be done anymore. Now we've got to understand what this is implying. What was going on in their mind? What, what part did the Ark of the Covenant play to the Jews? Because things are going to be different. And so we have, we have a lot to learn. You know what I've realized? that um, There are times, it's, when, you, when we get used to things, sometimes it's hard for us to imagine things to be any different than they are. And that is so ingrained. The longer you live, uh, the, long, the more you experience similar things, it's hard for us to imagine that life could be different. I remember when September 11th happened, 2001. That shook our world, did it not? Those of you that were of age, uh, I remember because, you know, that day when you're following it on the news, I'm thinking, and we didn't know what was ahead. You know, we didn't know that what the events on September 11th weren't going to just continue on. And it really, it, it was very unsettling. We had a church prayer meeting we called off the cuff, and the place was packed. Wow. People, people, you know, were something that scares us. And it's hard for people to imagine that things could have been different in the past. There's a, there's a teaching, uh, a theory called uniformitarianism. Have you ever heard of that? It says the way things are are the way things have always been. Uh, in fact, Peter talks about it without using that word, because that came in later maybe 1800s. But Peter uses that to say that people, you know, the promise of Jesus is coming. People are going to say, well, you know, where things are going to continue as they always have. And so just the very, the fact that there was a flood, that's what Peter's talking about. People are going to deny that there was a flood uh, because, or, or anything, because what do we see? That, that idea that we get so used to things that, um, that I think has carried over into the fact that we tend to look at the temporal things of this world uh, as what really matters. This is, the, this is the legitimate, this is the important stuff. And yet Paul says just the opposite. In 2 Corinthians 4.18, he says, We look not at the things which are seen. For the things which are seen are what? Temporal. The things which are not seen are are eternal. You know, it's amazing how many Christians look to heaven as if it's really not going to be too much fun there. You know? that What are we going to do? Are we going to strum harps all day and float around? And they, they fail to realize, wait a minute, the God that created this world and created all things for us to enjoy, you think of how many good things still, despite the curse that we caused, that man caused, Despite the curse, you think of how many blessed things there are that we can enjoy that Paul would tell Timothy, given us all things to enjoy. There are things, there's a lot of fun things, there's a lot of enjoyment that we get from life that somehow we think it's going to be so boring, it's just going to be sad in heaven. And it's going to be just the opposite, folks. You and I are not going to be disappointed. You and I are not going to be bored you and I are not going to, we're not going to long for the good old days on this sin-cursed world. It's not going to be that way. And so, if we can imagine this now, Israel, the Jews, had so become accustomed to their worship and the, and the, the place of the Ark of the Covenant and the temple, the tabernacle, and then the temple worship, and that what the Ark represented was not permanent. That was just a temporary thing. In fact, it would be, we're not even talking about the new covenant now. We're talking about 
you know, when God's judgment would come and Nebuchadnezzar would come in 587, 586 B.C., he would destroy Jerusalem. And, and, and definitely then, if, if there was the ark then, most people believe that the ark was destroyed. And so now, now Jeremiah is painting the fact that, you know, don't worry, you're, still, you're going to come back into the land. In fact, we have that in Ezra and Nehemiah. What a blessing. But you're going to come back into the land. But I want you to understand things are going to be different. That's where he talks of the Ark of the Covenant. So let's talk about the Ark of the Covenant. And don't, you don't need to turn to some of these verses I give you. In Exodus chapter 25, God instructed the Jews to build the Ark out of shittim wood, which was acacia wood. It's an old word for it. He gave the dimensions to us. It would be 45 inches long, 27 inches wide, and 27 inches high. And he also instructed them to put the, the tablets of the Ten Commandments in there. And the ark represented God's presence. Uh, now, at one point, the Philistines fought Israel and stole the ark and brought it back to their country. And then all kinds of problems happened to them. And so they looked at it as, oh, no, this is bad luck. And they sent it back to Israel. And then Israel kept it. And eventually they would use it in the tabernacle. They would use it in the, in the temple. And it became... A thing. In fact, later on, um, in Numbers chapter 17, it said, God said to Moses, Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony to be kept for a token against the rebels. And then in, ver in um, so they had eventually three things were put in there the Ten Commandments, the pot of manna, which uh, in um, Exodus 16 34, uh, they were told to set it aside. And then Aaron's rod that budded. You remember the whole story there. And those three things were put in the Ark of the Covenant. Now, according to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 4, and Charlie went over this many, many years, oh, a long time ago when he went preached through Hebrews, that uh, in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 4, these things were listed as being in the Ark of the Covenant. The golden pot that had manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. And so that represented God's presence. And every time the priest would go into the Holy of Holies, and he was only allowed to go once a year and offer blood upon the mercy seat, the mercy seat was upon the Ark of the Covenant between the two statues of the cherubim, and he would offer the blood. And God's presence was there. Listen to, listen to Leviticus, or excuse me, Exodus 25, verse 22. God said about the, the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant, said, and, and there will I meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things, which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. And then in, in Leviticus 16 and verse 2, it says, The Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat. So the high priest, he was, no high priest could go in but once a year. Um which is upon the ark, that he die not. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. So the Shekinah glory, God's presence, was associated with the ark of the covenant. It was a very important thing. So now look at Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 16. Out with the old. So it was hard for the, the Jewish mind, it was hard for them to imagine worshiping God without that central important place of the Ark of the Covenant. And in verse 16 it says, and, he, and it shall come to pass, when ye be multiplied and increased in the land. So now he's speaking about the days of restoration. He's enlarging on that. In those days, saith the Lord, they shall no more say, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done any more. Wow, that's interesting. Listen to what one theologian said about that. He said that it was not that Jeremiah was opposed to these symbols of Israel, Israel's worship. Material items, whether sacrifices, circumcision, or sacred furniture like the ark, were only pointers to spiritual realities and were of value only as long as they led men to the spiritual. That's a good point. And, and mankind has often forgot that. Uh, we have communion, which is 
to point us to a spiritual reality. But you look at church history and how communion has taken on a life that has magnified the, the symbolic and it is devoid of spiritual truth in many circles. And um, so they can be stumbling blocks. You know, things that were intended by God to be good. Incense. Incense was part of the worship required by God. And yet, in, uh, in Isaiah and other prophets, God said through them, I hate these offerings that you're doing. The incense, no more. Don't bring them anymore. It's like, wait a minute. How confusing could that be? Wait a minute, Lord. You established these things. Yeah, but you're, you're missing the heart. These things are only supposed to point you to me. And how... We're not void of that. We're not, we're not, not unvulnerable to that, right? I mean, we, the danger is that you and I lose the essence of our passion for Jesus Christ, and yet it is possible to replace it with religiosity, church things, or anything else. How dangerous that can be. Good example. In 2 Kings chapter 18, and verse 4, I'm going to read it to you. Um, do you remember the brazen serpent? That uh, when, when God judged Israel, when they were in Canaan, in, in, in the wilderness, God judged them for their murmuring and complaining, and, and a, a disease spread among them, and they died, and God's people you know, were so sorry, and Moses pled to the Lord, and he said, take this brazen, psalter and, and, uh, brazen serpent, put on a pole, lift it up, and everyone that looks at it will be spared. In fact, that would become a picture that Jesus would use of lifting up the Son of Man for salvation. So, so you know, they did that, and that serpent represented God's deliverance. Well, apparently, listen to 2 Kings verse 18 and verse 4. And Hezekiah, or he, Hezekiah, remember, Hezekiah is one of the kings that did right in the sight of the Lord. It just tells us that in 2 Kings 18. He removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves. Those were all things that were part of pagan worship. And break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it and called it Nehushtan, which is, a, I think, brazen serpent, something, a mighty serpent, great serpent. And so apparently this, this serpent that was used simply to, to, as a symbol for them to obey God became an issue in itself where they started worshiping it and burning incense unto it. And so, wait a minute, the, God was the deliverer. This is a created thing that simply represented something you were to do. But isn't it interesting? It's like they forgot the God that delivered them, and now they're worshiping the, 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 um, the golden serpent. They had to destroy it, and praise God, Hezekiah did. There was a time when that was very significant. The, the serpent, the golden serpent, was very significant. But it would be no more. Now, in the same way, folks, the Ark of the Covenant, which represented God's presence and was a, a holy piece of furniture and had significant things. In fact, some people called it the pledge chest because of what was in it and what it represented. And that was a very significant thing. It was placed in the holiest place uh, in the tabernacle when they set up the tent, moving. And then in the temple, when Solomon built the temple, it was placed in the holiest place. So it was a holy, legitimate piece of furniture. But God was preparing that it's going to be destroyed. It's not going to be around anymore. And it's not even going to be important. And that, hence this verse it shall be come to pass when you be multiplied and increased in the land in those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more. It won't even be in your conversation. The ark of the covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mind. Neither shall they remember it. Neither shall they visit it. Neither shall that be done anymore. So when they would go back in Ezra and Nehemiah's time, uh, and they would rebuild the temple, and they would rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, what wasn't included, what didn't need to be included, was the Ark of the Covenants. By the way, there's, there's several legends of the Ark of the Covenant. Of course, there is 
Some of you may remember back in 1981, the movie the, Lo the Raiders of the Lost Ark, which captured so many people's imagination. They made us think, wow, what if the Ark is still out there? Uh, and, and this one commentator, this one synopsis of that movie um, about the Ark, the Ark is incorrectly treated more like a pagan or extraterrestrial mystery than like the actual article as described in Scripture. Raiders of the Lost Ark builds on the factual basis, but blends the facts with a lot of fiction. The powers of the Ark are changed and amplified to fit the Nazis' desires. So we've got to remember, you know, the, the Ark of the Covenant was a legitimate thing, uh, but, you know, some of that story came from Hollywood. Uh, go back further. Uh, the book of Maccabees, 2 Maccabees, uh, chapter 2, uh, has a story that is, is legend and... and and remember that Maccabees was actual history, but it was not the Word of God. And there's a legend in there that, um, that states that Jeremiah hid the tabernacle and the ark in a cave so that it might be restored in later days. And if he did that, then what we're reading right now doesn't really mean anything. And it, it, again, directs our attention to the ark and say, well, maybe the ark was really important, and maybe Jeremiah was wrong. No. The ark was just a holy piece of furniture that represented God's presence. But there's going to come a time, folks, when it's, that's not going to be important because things are not what matter. Even those things that point us to Jesus Christ. What matters is our relationship with Yahweh. So the idea here, they're not going to remember it anymore. They're not even going to think about it. And again, remember, folks, that the it was very important. In fact, in, um, during Manasseh's reign in 2 Chronicles 33.7, he, uh, he came in, he was a wicked king, and he, re he removed the ark and put, um, what did he put? It's, in fact, it says, And Manasseh set a carved image, the idol which he had made in the house of God, and which God had said to David and to Solomon his son in this house, and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. So Manasseh desecrated it. And then when Josiah had his reforms in 2 Chronicles 35, he kept the Passover. And it says in 2 Chronicles 35, 1, And they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the first month, set the high priest in their charges, and encouraged them to serve in the house of the Lord. And he said unto the Levites that taught all of Israel, and which were holy unto the Lord, Put the holy ark in the house which Solomon, the son of King David of Israel, did build. It shall not be a burden upon your shoulders. Serve now the Lord with your God and his people. So they restored it. And that was a big deal. That was a highlight. This was uh, the revival time. Great things were happening. So this ark held special meaning to the Jews. But perhaps God knew that if he allowed Israel to keep the ark, and if he if that continued to represent his presence, that they would also burn our incense or worship that. And so he's preparing them pr probably for the destruction of the ark when Jerusalem is destroyed, when they are judged by King Nebuchadnezzar. He's preparing them so that they will be ready. You know, the ark, it's not going to be on your mind. What? How can the ark... You know, when, Ju when the Jews would eventually go back, go into captivity, the Judah, during that whole decades and decades of, of captivity, uh, there's a place in the Psalms, I wish I had it written down, but one of the Psalms, uh, the people in the land that they were being held captive asked them to sing the songs of, uh, I forget how it is, the songs of Israel, and they said, how shall we sing the Lord's song? How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? But it was always on their heart, always on their, you know, just to go back to Israel. And now God is telling them, you are going to come back. You know, you're going to come back. But the ark isn't what's important. It's my presence that's important. Now, how do we apply that today? There are many things today where, whether they're good or not, or whether they were once good or not, they can become stumbling blocks to us. That's why Paul says in Ephesians 4.22 that she put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts. Same thing in Colossians 3.8. He uses this phrase, put off all these things. And, and here's what God has always wanted, and he wants it with his people now. He wants us 
to have a vibrant, living, passionate relationship with Him. Daily walking with God. Not focusing on externals. I was sharing this with some family members recently that um, many of you know our background. We grew up in a church, high church, where there was a lot, a lot of sensory experiences. They had the incense. They had stained glass. They had statues, um, candles, uh, robes. The, the, all the, the ministers would wear robes and wear hats. and There was a lot of sensory experience. And when my wife got saved, she went to Bible Baptist in Westchester with me. And she tells me this. She, we walked in, and she looks around. She didn't see stained glass. She saw plain, clear windows. There were no statues. There was no incense. There was no candles. The minister wore a suit. There was no robes. And she, her first thought was, wow, they must not love God here. Isn't that I laugh at that now because they love the Lord, folks. They really did. But isn't that interesting? When you are so trained to the senses, you know, and that's, you know, the way we grew up, the, the senses were so important. You know, it was that worship was more, more about how you felt than, you know, that's, what did Jesus say? They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so maybe God is moving them away from that, but certainly you and I, it's, it's really about our relationship with the Lord. I, I read a story recently about, um, this was from a, a missionary named Worth, Dr. Worth Worley. And um, he says, he was a missionary in South Korea. And he said, one night while preaching at a halfway house in Taegu, South Korea, where Mrs. Worley and I were missionaries, a group of inmates, after hearing the word of God, came forward to receive Christ as their Savior. We were happy to help them. After we had thoroughly led them, uh, led them through the word of God, we then felt that they understood. Colonel Kim chong Hup was one of them that gladly received Jesus Christ. We then were having fellowship with them, and I learned that the colonel who had just received Christ was a North Korean. Then I learned his story. And Dr. Worley writes, It seems that he was a spy that had been caught attempting to come south in order to cut the president's head off. And the president at that time was Park Chung-hee. Uh, colonel Kim chang Hoop. Uh, was the leader of the spies. He had been in a South Korean prison for a number of years after he was caught. And, um, and then it was during that time where he heard the wonderful story of Jesus Christ and he was saved. Later, after he was released, he was baptized and he was very faithful in our Taejon Bible Baptist Church. Work was very scarce at that time, especially for an ex-communist spy. Therefore, I put him in as the janitor of our church. From the high rank of a colonel, he was promoted to be janitor of our Tejon Baptist Church. I love that. He got promoted. He was the colonel of an army, and he did not mind. He looked at it as a promotion. Because, you know, better to be a doorkeeper in the house of God. Uh, you know, the, he, here he's a janitor for God, and that beats being a colonel in a, in a wicked army. What an awesome thing. Now, here's the thing. Whatever, whatever matches or parallels, whatever represents our walk with Christ today, that's what is significant. That's why Paul said, we don't look at the things which are seen. That is not easy. So many believers, they're not just looking at the things which are seen. They are fixated by the things which are seen. They are living for the things which are seen. They are delighting and thinking that the things which are seen are is all that we have to live for. And what did Jesus say? Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and thieves break through and steal. Rather, lay up, lay up treasure in heaven. So the transformation. Verse 17. At that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. Now remember, at this point, it was the Ark of the Covenant in between the cherubims that was the presence of the Lord. That represented the presence of the Lord. And in many Old Testament scriptures, that, that was referred to. God was in between the two cherubims. At that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, 
and all the nations shall be gathered unto it to the name of the Lord to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil hearts. So what a blessing. One, one uh, theologian, two theologians actually writing together said, Hence it is justly concluded that the ark had perished in the destruction of Jerusalem by the Chaldeans, that would be Nebuchadnezzar, and that upon rebuilding of the temple after the exile, the ark was not restored because the nucleus of it, the tables of the law written by the finger of God, could not be constructed by the hand of man. And the dwelling in the throne of the Lord amidst his people was again to come about, but in a higher form. Jerusalem is to become the throne of, of Yahweh. Jerusalem um, is to be for the renewed Israel that which the ark had been for the former Israel, the holy dwelling place of God. And so verse 18, we move on. It says, In those days the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel, and they shall t- come together out of the land of the north, to the land I have given for an inheritance under your father. So one of the signs that they would that there would be a restoration and that God would be with them truly was a united Israel. In those days the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel, and they shall come together out of the land of the north. Now at that point, Assyria is referenced, but it seems that and depending on when Jeremiah was given this prophecy. Uh, in his mind, at least, he, he already understood that, that, um, that Judah was also going to be in Babylon. And there, you know, so he's setting up for what we would read about in Ezra and Nehemiah, that the, the, the restoring to the land. So let's make the application. While the Ark of the Covenant was a holy piece of furniture... And, and those of us that came out of religion, you know, there's an application there that the things that, you know, if, if you grew up and religion to you had to do with the smells and the sights and the, the feeling, you know, you, you had to feel holy. Uh, and I remember, because, of, because this was drilled in my head, I remember as a young boy, there were times when I wanted to get close to the Lord, and I'd literally set up an altar in my bedroom. And I had a kneeler, and I had a candle, and I bought a bust of Jesus what I thought was a bust of Jesus, which now I realize is probably nothing at all like that. But, but you know, if there were times, and, and I remember this. I, I don't think I've ever said this, and please don't repeat this. Glad it's not going out over the Internet. I remember wearing my, putting on my, my altar boy outfit, and, you know, it was kind of like my version of a priest. And then I would say prayers. I think I did the rosary a couple times, and that made me feel close to God. That's not what a relationship with God is, is all about. It's not about the feeling. A relationship with God is, is walking with the Lord. It's experiencing newness of life. I want to close with this a verse. And again, when God tells Israel you're going to be restored, there's going to be unity and harmony among the people of God. And by the way, that is clearly going to be one of the signs. When you and I get to heaven, uh, there's going to be a sweet harmony uh, now, now, there is a false movement to try to bring peace to the church called the ecumenical movement, which has good intentions and is filled by well-meaning people who downplay doctrine and teaching and unity becomes the primary doctrine. Can't we all just get along is the, is the mantra? Uh, and, and that's not God made. God made unity. Is, is brought on by the Lord. Paul said this. In fact, let me, let me two, two verses as we close. Philippians 1, 23 and following, it says, for, Paul says, for I am in a strait betwixt two. You remember this? I'm, I'm in a fix. I'm, I'm in a bind. I'm in a strait betwixt two. Having a desire to be with Christ. You remember what he says after that? He says, it's far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So he's, he's, he's in a quandary. I really want to go to heaven. That is far better. But here, here I am. He was writing again to the Philippians. He said, nevertheless, for me to stay here in this earth, it is more needful for you. And he says in them, verse 20, having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. 
Now, I want you to think about this. This was Paul's, this is what was, how Paul was wired. The idea of heaven, to depart and be with Christ, is far better. Consolation prize, I got to stay here. It's more needful. I'm needed, and so I'm going to abide here. Now, what, how do many Christians approach it? We look at it the opposite. I think I, it, many people, it comes across in the attitude. To be with Christ, oh, man, I don't want, I don't want to go just yet. I'm having too much t- good time here. This is the best thing. Living here, living on this side of glory, this is what's really important. And I hope I get to live a long life. And I hope I get everything that this world can give. And, oh, yeah, there's always the consolation prize that we go to heaven. It is, heaven is not a consolation prize. Heaven is the glory. Paul says it's far better. And then here's what he said in Romans 8, 8, 18. He said, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The sufferings or the deprivations or even the, you know, the, the challenges of this life are not worthy to be compared with the glory of which shall be revealed. And when Paul is t- or what uh, Jeremiah was telling Judah, your relationship right now, even as important as you think the Ark of the Covenant is and, and worship in the temple and that, that whole thing, it's not worthy to be compared with what God has ahead for you. I am reminded of the need for us, you know, that this, this world, it's not far better in this world. And um, I came across a study recently from Bioethics Institute of the New York Medical College, a doctor named Daniel Solmacy. Uh, he's the one that he was the he's the head of Bioethics Institute, and he made an interesting discovery while observing dying patients in a hospital. And maybe this came across my mind because, uh, you know, my my parents were moved into an assisted living home. God bless people like Roxanne and and I think Violet, people that live and work every day, it, it can be a very sad place. Uh, when I would visit with my dad across the hallway, uh, a lady, I remember the first time a lady cried out, help me, please help me, and she seemed in genuine distress. And, and nobody seemed to be coming to her, and then I realized that every time I came after is that she, that was her life. I mean, she just, and, and there were the, the, it wasn't that there was any neglect from the staff because they tried, you know, they tried to help her and minister to her, but it was just what was going on in this lady's mind. And it was so sad. Uh, one lady just walked back and forth from my dad's room and all the rooms going down the hallways singing, take me out to the ball game. God bless her. Give me some peanuts and cracker jack. And she, sometimes she'd have the words right and sometimes she'd really mess them up. Uh, but what a, what a blessing she was. Just, uh, in fact, I, I got talking to her and, um, I won't, I won't say her name because I forget her name. But she said, I am so-and-so from Schuylkill. Schuylkill. She's from Schuylkill. The good side, not the bad side. So I don't know what she meant by that. But, you know, these, these dear ladies, and there's such sadness. So in this study of dying patients, he aimed, this doctor aimed cameras at the doorways of the terminally, terminally ill patients and tracked the number of minutes they spent alone. Being alone without having a Savior to walk with, it's a very sad thing. And he, he concluded that these patients spend more than 18 hours a day, there was no one in their room. And that's heartbreaking. Nur- nurses checked on patients a dozen times during the day for two or more, you know, no more than two minutes at a time. Doc- doctors averaged three visits a day. They were three minutes each. Visits from family members averaged 24 minutes per day. And um, they, they were... The only, only visits that lasted over five minutes. He said that patients who are terminally ill list isolation and abandonment as their biggest fears. And yet it's what they most often experience. You know, we live in a world, folks, where it has been cursed by sin. And God has left us here to minister to people. He's put us in families He's given us the ability to love one another. He's put us in churches so that we can bear one another's burdens and have uh, what so many people don't have. But folks, when we get to heaven, we are going to walk. We are going to see Jesus Christ. We are going to have fellowship. And one, one thing you and I will never, ever, ever experience is 
loneliness. But I want you to imagine the contrast. Because there is a place that those who die without Jesus Christ must go. And it's no fault of God's. He is a God of love, but he's a God of holiness. He must punish sin. In fact, next Sunday morning, we're going to talk about the fact that God must punish sin. He would not be God. In fact, we would have reason to condemn him if he was not a righteous judge. And he is. But because of that, he must punish sin. So people who reject Jesus Christ have made their own choice. And they will spend eternity in isolation. So if you're not saved, get saved. Get born again. That's what everyone needs. Let's bow in prayer. Father, thank you for the word. Thank you for Jeremiah. Thank you for this challenge regarding the Ark of the Covenant. And what a special thing it was uh, as it represented your presence and as you actually did reside in the Holy of Holies and you actually did meet uh, with God's people and meet with the, the uh, high priest once a year and that you, your presence was over that ark. And uh, it, it became such a very important piece of furniture. But Father, it was nothing, nothing to be compared with what Israel would have then in the future and, and now in the future. And what we have is, is a relationship with you. We get to walk with you. And Father, help us to realize that that's our most valuable asset this side of glory it's not our earthly possessions not even our relationships uh, with one another not it, not our health not our bank accounts that the most valued possession that we have on this side of glory even before we get to heaven is our relationship with you so lord help us to invest in it help us to cultivate it help us to treasure it and lord maybe there's some that are away from you, I pray that you'd bring them back to a close walk with you. And we'll thank you for it. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, let's take your hymn books out. Let's all stand, and we will close in song. All right, let's turn to hymn number 74. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Hymn 74. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. O oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy help and salvation. O oh, ye who hear, that to His
but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. Let me walk close to thee.